Well, thank you, Corn Orchestra. Let's open our Bibles to this passage we looked at last week, Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, in verse 33. And I started the message last week. I don't even know if I'll get all the way through with this one today. You know, in the season of Thanksgiving, we'll look at different things that we're to be thankful for. We're always told to count our blessings. There's a hymn that says, Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And uh, we'll do that, but I'm just wondering what do we thank the Lord for. I think a lot of times we'll certainly thank Him for health, if you're healthy. If you have blessings materially, you'll thank Him for that. You'll thank Him for your family, maybe for your church family. Thank Him for our veterans and all that. I wonder how much time we ever spend, if we ever do this, to thank Him for next to Jesus Christ, really the greatest treasure He's ever given us, and that's His Word. I mean, do we spend time in the day ever of going, Lord, I want to thank you that you have spoken to me in your word and you have provided your word for me, your message, not just for me, but for nations you've given your teaching. Listen, that's one of the things that we should be most appreciative of. Jesus makes a comment here in Luke chapter 21, verse 33, when he's talking about unusual events and ha happenings one that's going to come very soon, the fall of Jerusalem, one that will come at the end of time, his return to the earth. And the Lord Jesus, in the midst of all that, he says in verse 33, he said, here's what you can count on. Heaven and earth will pass away. But he said, my words will never pass away. Well, what we looked at last week in our study was trying to underscore what the words of Jesus are because a lot of people say, well, the words of Jesus, that's what's written in the Gospels. And if you have that red letter edition, you can tell your, your kids, hey, the, the words written in red, those are the words of Jesus. But we tried to underscore for you last week and show you examples of it in the Bible where the words of Jesus are the entire Bible because Jesus is God and he breathed this message. And we gave you some examples from the Old Testament where the Lord pre-incarnate Christ was speaking and he spoke to Abraham and he spoke to those in Noah's generation. So all of the Bible, the words of Christ. And Jesus, when he makes this statement, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never will. It's not just talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's talking about the whole of Scripture. Well, let's think now about the meaning of this. His words will never pass away. Uh, one thing, and what is so very obvious, meaning they will always exist. And you may say, well, that's no big profound truth. I think it's staggering. His words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But His words, the one, one thing that's going to last as it is throughout all eternity is the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away. Read the last part of the book of Revelation. It says there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And the earth as we know it today, it's, it's in existence today. The universe as we know it, it's not always going to exist. It's going to be transformed. You and I right now, the way we are in these bodies, we won't always exist like this. The body, Bible teaches after we die, our bodies are either cremated or they're buried at sea or they're buried in the ground. The resurrection day, those bodies will come forth, be reunited with our spirits. But these bodies are going to be transformed. They're not going to be the same. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. And yet Jesus Christ says this, all things in heaven and earth will not be the same as they are. They will pass away. But there's one thing that won't, and it's my word. My word. It is forever going to stand. So always in existence. There's one meaning of it that's very clear. Here's something else that's uh, very clear when you think my words will never pass away. These words will never be altered. They will never be changed. What is true in the mind of God in the days of Abraham is true in the mind of God today. What is wrong way back hundreds, thousands of years ago was wrong with civilization, wrong in the hearts of men, behaviors that were wrong, those same behaviors are still wrong. Now, in every generation, it seems like people want to get away from this, and especially in our time, because it's like people now, they've had new epiphanies. They have new insights. They have evolved to understand that things that used to be declared right, that they don't feel are right now. And things that used to be declared as wrong, well, they don't feel they're wrong now. And they feel it's perfectly acceptable. And they, they think to themselves, well, listen, it's a different time. And the opinions of people have changed. And people are favoring certain behaviors now that maybe they didn't favor in the past. 
Well, let me tell you something. Behaviors that the Bible says are an abomination before the Lord, in every generation, those same behaviors have been exhibited, and by the people who were involved in that, they thought it was okay, just like in our times. But here's what you need to know. God never changes. He never changes on this. What he says is true in his word about relationships, about how one should conduct themselves in life, just in the practical affairs of life of being just, true, honest, pure. Those things never change. And friend, you may have it all worked out in your mind where it's changed for you. And you think you're, you're legit and, and perfectly okay because you come to church, but I've changed in my thinking and I don't agree with everything the scripture says then you've got a major problem in your life. You have a major problem because in your changing, you've moved away from the one who never changes. You've moved away from him. When it says, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away, they will never be altered. God's opinion will never be altered. Issues like salvation. I mean, people have a thousand different ways now you can be saved. God says, hey, there's one way, one way that you can have forgiveness and have life that's everlasting. And that's through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And I don't care who stands up and suggests that there is. God says there's no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father unless he comes by me. That never, never changes. Regardless of what culture, what, what country, what people's group you're speaking to that never changes but then there's this his words saying they won't pass away means this his words will come true and you need to know that his words are going to come true we have so many examples of that two things I'd mention on this one events that are spoken of in the scripture that are prophesied in the scripture they're going to come true they will absolutely come true now, you can't get away from that. I mean, we already see examples of that in the Bible. And I'll mention these to you. In Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah the prophet told the people, he said, because of your rebellion and your sin, you're going to go into captivity. He told them where they were going into captivity. God gave him the message. He said, the Babylonians will come and take you into this captivity. And he said this, you're going to be there for 70 years. The best thing you can do once you get there is just do the best that you can, abide by their, their laws, and, and work in the best way that you possibly can. You'll be delivered after 70 years. Well, now, there were religious leaders going around saying in that day, they were just repudiating what Jeremiah said. And the religious leaders were going, oh, that's not true. There's peace. There's peace. We'll always have peace. It doesn't matter how we're living. It doesn't matter that we've forsaken God. Because they would suggest, even though the people by their behavior and their actions had shown that they'd forsaken the Lord, these religious leaders would suggest, oh no, God's on our side and there's peace. And I just remind you in that day and in Isaiah's day who prophesied to these people, well, they were prospering materially. Well, you can't feature that. We, we're not going into captivity. Are you kidding? And Jeremiah said, here's a message from God. God's message says this. Because of your rebellion and your sin, you've turned against me. Then my servant, he called Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, is going to come. And the Babylonians are going to overthrow you. And they're going to take you into captivity. And let me tell you something. That happened exactly as God said. They were not only taken into captivity in Babylon, they stayed there exactly 70 years, just like God said. And then they were delivered and came back to their home country, just like God said through his prophet in his word. That's amazing. I'll tell you, you see it right here in, in this gospel of Luke in chapter 21. Jesus is leaving the temple area with the disciples, and the disciples are so thrilled. And I wish I could describe the Herod's temple for you. It was just majestic. I, we can look at our buildings here, uh, look at the White House or the Capitol buildings, and there's a measure of beauty. Those things don't even compare to what Herod's temple looked like. 
I mean, it was just breathtakingly beautiful. And Jesus walks out, and these, these disciples, they're so thrilled with this. They said, Lord, look at this. Look at this. And look what Jesus says to them. The disciples were remarking in verse 5 of Luke 21 about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. And Jesus said this, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left upon another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And if you'd see that temple, you'd think, that can't happen. I mean, they didn't have airplanes in those days that could crash into buildings. They didn't have nuclear missiles and things like that that they could blow up this building with. These guys could have thought to themselves, now the disciples believed what he said, but when people hear that, they think, that can't happen. Jesus said that in the early A.D. 30s. By A.D. 70, what he said came to pass. The Romans came in under Titus' leadership and devastated Jerusalem. And this temple was, it was like it was unearthed. It was devastated, just like he said. All that prophecy came true. I'll tell you this, the Lord says this in the Old Testament. He talks about the people of the Jewish people. He not only talked about the Babylonian captivity, but uh, there's references towards the end of time. And he said before he comes back, before the Messiah comes back, he said, my people who have been dispersed, the Jewish people who have been dispersed throughout the nations, they're going to be brought back to their homeland. Now for years, from the fall of Jerusalem, what we've read of here in Luke 21, until 1948, that's exactly what it is. The Jews were dispersed all over this world. And then in 1948, bit by bit, they've been going back. In 1948, they're back in their own country. And it is a miracle of God that that could happen. Surrounded by people who hate them, who want them annihilated, and yet there they sit. Just like God said. Now listen to what he says in his word, what he prophesies. And when I see all those things there, then I'm, I'm a bit uh, baffled by some people, not so much by lost people, but by people who attend church. So when you talk to them about the judgment at the end of time that he prophesies about, and you talk about the return of Christ, which he speaks of, they don't buy into that. And they think, hey, come on. I mean, Christ has been gone for 2,000 years. He, he died on the cross 2,000 years ago and ascended out of heaven and Oh, 2,000 years, all this time has come and gone. Where is he? I mean, people get into this notion that life's just a cycle. It'll just keep going on and on and on. No matter how we live, no matter what we do, it's just a cycle. You're born. If you're fortunate enough to get to grow up, you work. And then you live long enough. You get to retire a while, then you die. And it's just a cycle. And it's always going to be that way. The Bible says, no, it is not. And there's some people that live their lives in such a way and they think they're never going to have to give account. They're not going to ever have to face any kind of judgment. Do you know the Bible speaks about a Christian judgment? The Bible speaks about the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the lost. And I don't even know that Christians buy into the teaching about the Christian judgment. But the Lord says, it's, it's true. Look over here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about the Christian judgment. It says in verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stone, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. These are people who build on his foundation with gold, silver, precious stone. 
They build in a way that honors God using their gifts, using their talents, their resources in a way to honor the Lord. And he says they'll receive a reward, but you build with wood, hay, and stubble. You live life your own way. Totally do not acknowledge what Jesus says is true and what the Bible says is true. It says those works will be tested. And it says if it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. He's a believer, but he will suffer loss only as one escaping through the flames. Listen, how are you building on the foundation of Jesus Christ? Does that ever dawn on you? You ever think about this? You say, you know, I don't lie. I don't think. I don't think he's really going to do that. Why would you think that? Why would you ever think that, knowing all these other things that we talked about that have been fulfilled exactly like he said they're going to be fulfilled, and then you read this and think, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that applies. It's going to come to pass exactly like he says. Now look over here in Revelation chapter 20 because I may be speaking to several people in here today. You've never given your life to Christ. And you just live your life in the way that you want to. And you feel comfortable with the way that you're living. And you've got your own set of beliefs. And now you've resigned yourself to that. And you've justified your beliefs that you don't agree with everything the Scripture says. And you think this teaching about Jesus Christ being the only way of salvation, that that's just a bit narrow and a bit bigoted. I mean, just a bit bigoted. And we've got to be more open-minded. We've got to be more inclusive. We've got to be more accepting of these different beliefs. But listen, you want to be respectful of all people. You want to love all people. But you're not helping all people if you run out here and go, you know, I understand. I understand you, you have your belief, and that's okay. If you're satisfied with your belief and it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but you're okay with it, and you have peace, well, then that's okay. You're not helping anybody if you do that. And if you're somebody like that, please look what it says right here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. It says this. John on the Isle of Patmos is receiving this revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Bodies are buried at sea. Well, those bodies are going to be reclaimed. And death, death is the grave. That's bodies are there. They're going to be reclaimed. Hades is where the spirit of the lost person goes when they die. And it says that spirit is going to be released and those bodies are going to be reunited with the spirit. But it's going to be different. Their bodies are different from the believer's body. And it says this, if you look at it, the sea, death, Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. Do you know that Jesus Christ said this? Every idle word that men shall speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. They'll give account. He's speaking to lost people there. Every idle word, they're going to give account. And then it says, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire, that's the eternal hell. This is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And some people read that and think, God's not going to do that. Are you kidding me? God loves us all. God wouldn't dare do that. Well, God didn't prepare hell, the eternal hell, for human beings. The Bible says it's prepared for the devil and his angels. But when people sin and stay in their sin and never come to the place where they receive Jesus Christ, where they can have forgiveness, then that hell that is prepared for the devil and his angels, that is exactly where they're going. You think, do you enjoy preaching this? I hate preaching this. I wish I could just stand up to you and say, let me tell you, God loves all of you. Y'all get to go to heaven. Doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter what you believe. Y'all get to go. Everybody gets to go. That's just not true. And yet people will hear that and they just think, oh, I don't believe that. Again, I'd ask, what would give you any basis for rejecting that based on all the things that you can see in the Bible and in history that shows what he prophesied in the past has come to fulfillment? What makes you think this won't? 
Look over here in 2 Peter chapter 3. I mean, this is a good description of people in our day. It says this, 2 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. He says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Let me tell you, there's a lot of unwholesome thinking going on in the lives of people. Spiritually, morally, ethically. He says, I'm writing this to stimulate wholesome thinking within your life. He said, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through the, your apostles. First of all, you've got to understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, hey, where's the promise of his coming? Hey, where is that? You Bible thumpers, where's the promise of his coming? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world at, at, of the time was delu deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But he said, you need to know this. Why, here all this time's gone by? But it's because the Lord's patience. That's all that's showing. But he said, the day of the Lord, when it comes, it's going to come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And Peter writes those words inspired of God. And he simply says, look, there's scoffers out there, and there always will be, and there's scoffers in this day and age in which we live, and you may be one. You say, I don't, I don't buy this. I don't think he's coming back. Well, I'll tell you, he is. He is. And it's going to be just as it says. And the Lord's patience with you and with me and with civilization, it's his patience that prolongs this. But when that day comes, it's going to be just like a thief. I had one of my friends, faithful member in this church. He talked to me last night, and he said, uh, he said, do you own a gun? I said, well, no, I don't. He said, well, I don't either, but he said, I'm thinking about getting one. I said, well, why? What's happened? He said, well, Wednesday, we were broken into. Our house was broken into. He said, my wife came home, and some of our jewelry was gone. I said, well, do you have an alarm system? And he said, well, no, it's, we just have a little beeper. It just beeps a little bit just to alert us if we're in the house. I said, it's not a siren going off or anything like that if somebody comes in. He said, no. I said, you need to get one of those. You need to get one of those. But he said, they came in. Told, we had no expectation. Just came in, took some of our stuff, and left. And the Bible writer says when Jesus Christ comes back, People are not going to be expecting this. They're not going to be anticipating this. When he comes back, it'll be just like a thief. Just like a thief. In an instant. And it's all over. And for people who have met the Lord and know him, that will be the greatest day ever. But for people who don't know him, that's going to be a day of unbelievable horror and terror for them. Because they're going to understand then that the one that they have rejected is going to be the one that they have to bow before and the one who brings judgment upon their life. Listen, when Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, 
what he says, what he prophesies, it's going to come to pass. It is going to come to pass. Now, one last thing, and I'll just preach my message next week on this. There's one other thing you need to know. When it says what he says will, will be true, principles of living and consequences of choices, lifetime choices, in regard to those principles, that's going to come true also. And here's the simple little principle. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a person soweth, that is what they're going to reap. And there's no exception to that. You sow to the Spirit, you can reap life everlasting. You sow to the flesh, and you're going to reap corruption. And I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how wealthy you are. You're not an exception to this. I don't care what your age is. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap life. That's God's Word. And it plays out every single day in the lives of people, individuals, families. I'll tell you what, it plays out in the life of a nation too. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I just pray for us. Thank you for your word. Help us in this Thanksgiving season. Well, we're thanking you for blessings. Help us never to overlook this one. What a great treasure. We have a message from you. I think of these veterans. I think of people who serve overseas right now, when they get a letter from home or any correspondence from home, how it just thrills them to hear from their, their wife or their husband or their kids or their parents, and, and rightly so. But Father, help us to know in this book, the Bible, we have a personal message from you to us. Father, help us to view it as such and help us to take to heart exactly what you say. Father, I pray for anyone in this room who's never received you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior. I pray that you'd work in their hearts and draw them to make this commitment. Just wake them up spiritually. Help them to know, Jesus, they need you. Father, I pray for believers in this room that maybe they've gotten to a place in their life where they have discounted what you say in your word. Or, Father, maybe they've gotten to a place where they just think that they can live life however they want to live it, and nobody can do anything about that. And Father, help them to know that's not true. Help them to understand if they're so into fleshly things, whatever that might be, that Lord Jesus, they're going to reap corruption. That's what you teach. Help us to know though, and I pray for believers out here that maybe they're living their life for you and they have a heart for you and yet things are unraveling in their world, help them to know if they sow to the Spirit. No matter what's going on, you're going to bless them and help them. Just give them that peace and, and that encouragement. The Lord Jesus, I ask this all in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we're going to be dismissed in just a moment. If you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Savior, you can do that today, and we invite you to do it. This is our invitation to you. As soon as we're dismissed, I'll be standing right here at the front. I'd love to talk with you. And we have others that will come down here. They'll be able to talk with you also. But we can share with you how you can receive the Lord Jesus, how you can make him the Savior of your life. He wants to be. But you've got to come to him. So we hope that you do that. You might be a person, you say, well, I just have a lot of questions about this. That's wonderful. We'd love to visit with you and talk with you. It could be that you're a believer, you're looking for a church home, you feel like this is where you'd like to place your life. If that's true, we hope you can come and express that. We'll tell you how you can be a part here. We'd love to have you. Or please listen to this. You might be a believer, and you know, you know, maybe nobody else knows, but you know, that you've wandered so far from God. You have gotten so far from Him, and you're just tired of that. Or maybe God just spoken to you in this last little thought. And alerted you to the fact you don't get away with that. Maybe you've gotten away with it for a while. You don't get away with it forever. And maybe you just need to come. And You don't have to tell what you've been involved in, anything like that. Maybe you just need to say, look, I need to get my life right with Christ. I need prayer. If that's true, you come, please.